Good afternoon. Hi. You can talk back to me. Hey, woo, now I feel good about this. How's everybody doing? I just cleared my karma. I really feel light. Doesn't it? Don't I like look and feel better? Well, you can't tell how I feel. Anyway, welcome. How many of you have been in, this is your third session of the day. You've been in the other two. I know you have, I have. Oh my gosh. The last one was just intense. It was amazing. Anyone in the last one? With, wasn't that amazing? Oh my gosh, I, I think that cleared my karma too. Um, all of you got a raffle ticket on the way in. At the end, you have to be here at the end, we're going to draw for um, a trip to Kapala. Is that right? Did I say that right? Kapalu? Kripalu. Thank you, spirit guide. Um, in the Berkshires. So it's worth $525, so that's pretty impressive. So, And just uh, how many of you agree today has been just amazing? Oh, my goodness. So much to do, so much to learn, so much to win. This lovely young lady won a $200 gift certificate to the container store in the first session. So we'll see if you have... I know she's sitting here going, call my number again. So I'm very excited about our third and final speaker today. And again, after this session, you can go down to the main floor. How many of you have made a trip through that main floor with all the vendors? Right, right? I see smiles now. <laughs> There's so much to do here. And I'd love to, I'm going to thank the Gemma Foundation for all it does in bringing everyone together, cancer survivors, family members, people who just want to get on the path to wellness. Um, thank you, Gemma family. And I know we have Maria here and I think, and, and Gloria. And yeah, but we have all the, all the Gemmas stand up because there's like 25 of you. <laughs> One, two, three. So where are the other 20? <laughs> So I'm very excited to talk about our next speaker. Uh, her name is Dr. Boham. Where is Dr. Boham? Oh, all the way, you, you know what, the light, you, I can't see you for the light. Have you heard that before? Or you could walk into the light. She'll be downstairs after this, but in the vendor area on the first floor to sign her DVD, Breast Wellness Tools to Prevent and Heal from Breast Cancer. So she'll be doing that afterwards, but I think I need to tell a little bit about her now, and I think I might have passed that, or I might be blinded by the light, or I found it. Okay. Our keynote speaker, Dr. Elizabeth Boham, MD, MSRD. Well, you have a lot of titles I here. Know. It's, like, too many. it's kind of impressive. <laughs> Is a physician and nutritionist. I love to see that combination because not all physicians are nutritionists, who practices functional medicine at the Ultra Wellness Center in Lenox, Massachusetts. Through her practice and lecturing, she has helped thousands of people achieve their goals of optimum health and wellness. She witnesses the power of nutrition every day in her practice and is committed to training other physicians to utilize nutrition in healing. Is it right? You are what you eat? Yeah, she's going to talk about that, right? Mm -hmm. Dr. Boham has contributed to many articles and wrote the latest chapter on obesity for the Rankle Textbook of Family Medicine. So she's in the textbook. <laughs> I'm glad you got that. She is also part of the faculty of the Institute for Functional Medicine and has been featured on the Dr. Oz show. Hey, go girl. Mm -hmm. Isn't he nice? Yes. I love nice. him, and he's kind of cute. In a variety of publications and media, including the Huffington Post, the Chalkboard Magazine, wow, and Experience Life. Her DVD, Breast Wellness Tools to Prevent and Heal from Breast Cancer. How many of you have or have had breast cancer in this room? Yeah, that's why a lot of you are here. Tools to Prevent and Heal from Breast Cancer explores the functional medicine approach to keeping your breasts and whole body well. I'm very impressed by this. I don't even really think I need to read any more about her. So let's bring up to the podium, Dr. Boham. Thank you. 
cute. She's cute. That was lovely. Way to go. <laughs> and she's tall. Oh, I got heels on. Thank you so much, Barbara. Thanks so much for having me. What a wonderful organization, the Gloria Gemis Foundation. And this weekend is phenomenal, huh? Oh, I, all these events and activities, it's really inspirational and a wonderful time for us all to get together. And so thank you so much for having me as part of this. I really, I really appreciate it. Thank you. So um, you went to my end. <laughs> Go back to the beginning. <laughs> Oh, there we go. Okay, wonderful. So um, September 2nd, 1999, I was healthy, right? I, I was really healthy. I was really interested in nutrition and exercise physiology. I was so interested in prevention. I really wanted to prevent everything. And, um, and then September 3rd, 1999, I had surgery what, and what ended up being an invasive triple negative breast cancer. And, and like so many of you here, I was like, oh my goodness, what, what just happened? I was this healthy woman and I was, you know, re we were thinking about starting a family and, and, and life was good and I was practicing what I preached. You know, I'm all interested in nutrition and prevention. And, and then you get this diagnosis. And so then what happens, right? Those five stages of grief happen, what well, happened to me, and so many of you have gone through it too, right? The first is denial, and there was no doubt. I was like, okay, this is not, this is not breast cancer. I didn't have any family history of breast cancer. I, um, I never suspected this was breast, I had all sorts of other reasons why I had this lump that was removed. And even as a physician, I mean, we sent the pathology somewhere else, right? So that denial thing goes on for a while, and then the anger, okay, now I'm pissed off. I did everything right and what's going on, right? And so that lasts for a while, and then the bargaining. And I was like, please God, I just wanna have children. It's really, really what I wanted. Um, I was 30, and it was so important to me, and then when this happens, you realize how really important that was, and they were saying, well, maybe you can't because of the chemotherapy and all of that. So after the chemotherapy and radiation, my periods came back, you know, the hot flashes subsided a little bit, and lo and behold, a few months later, I was pregnant with my daughter, which was wonderful. She's now 16 and just got her driver's license, and I know. <laughs> and, um, and, uh, and then, you know, was able to breastfeed on um, one breast, and then I got pregnant with my son, and, and then, you know, was able to breastfeed him for, on one breast for a while, and then that, that fourth stage set in, the depression. And it was probably a little bit like, okay, I just went, you know, I was in residency for medicine and there was a lot going on and then I had treatment and then there was uh, kids and hormones and, you know, and also just the realization that, okay, this really did happen to me. Um, I was like done with the plowing through. It was like, okay, then the depression sets in and you're like, oh boy. And that lasted for a while, but it finally lifted and that fifth stage, the acceptance came came through and I was like, okay, this did happen to me. I am somebody who had breast cancer. You know, this, I am now a survivor and, and what, why did that happen? That's when you start to go, what, what, what happened? I thought I had kind of had it all figured out and you know, obviously maybe not all of it figured out if we ever can figure it all out. And that's when I started to um, learn more actually about functional medicine. And we'll talk a little bit about functional medicine, though that's not the, the highlight of the talk, but it is, it is how I really have, have evolved in my medical practice and how I really think about health now. And so I wanna just touch on that a little bit, but then we're gonna sort of switch back into what can we all do for self-care and, and wellness and, and healing and health. So functional medicine really is, is, is prevention-based you know, it's looking for the underlying root causes in the body. It is science-based, it, but it really appreciates how we're all biochemically individual. It's patient-centered as opposed to disease-centered, really appreciating that if we have, you know, 50 people here with breast cancer, we're gonna have multiple different types of breast cancers, but even if you take the estrogen receptor positive breast cancer, right? And you're going to have multiple different reasons for why that person got that estrogen receptor positive breast cancer. And we've got to start in medicine asking that question why and looking back toward what is that person's individual risk. Because if you can figure that out for that person, that can help them further prevent disease in the future. 
So very patient-centered. And really appreciating all the interconnections in our body. Right, where we, we do know, we recognize that when we have, we have gum disease, when people have gingivitis, right, they have an increased risk of heart disease. That's kind of been talked about for a long time. But now we're really appreciating that the digestive system, for example, has influence on, on other things in our body, like our weight or even risk of, of cancer. So we're, we, we really appreciate is how all the different systems in the body are interconnected and influence how well the body is. So we, and most importantly, as I said, we ask that question, why? And, and as I said earlier, it's not just cancer we're talking about, but cancers. There's multiple different types of cancers and, and multiple different reasons why somebody's body develops cancer. And, and as, as I was mentioning earlier, not just breast cancer, but breast cancers, multiple different types of breast cancers. And even if you take a specific type of breast cancer, multiple different reasons for why that happens in somebody's body. And what's really frustrating for lots of people, and I can understand that because it was for me too, but there's multiple different hits that occur in your body that can then influence if a cancer is going to grow. So, you know, there may have been some exposure at a really young age and then, and then in, you know, to some toxin and then there is an influence um, from a big stress in your life. And then maybe there's, you know, there's some other, uh, um, you know, your body's not necessarily keeping the right, uh, there's too much inflammation in the body. And all those things can come together and have an influence on whether cancer is going to grow and become invasive or not. Really, I focus on we've got to create a healthy terrain in our body, right? The terrain is like the soil in your body that's feeding the cancer, or sorry, feeding the cells in your body. So for so long, we were focused on that individual cancer cell. Now we're really thinking, we're, we're thinking, okay, we've got to really focus on all the terrain, the soil, the, the, what's, what's feeding or influencing the cells in your body. Because if the terrain, if the soil is really pro-inflammatory or, or high levels of blood sugar or insulin, that can cause cancer to grow. On the other hand, if it's more of, an, of a healthy terrain in your body, cancer is less likely to grow. And so for each person, we want to figure out what is it that's, that may be causing some imbalances? What do we need to remove that may be causing some inflammation or irritation in their body? And what do we need to replace? Are they deficient in a certain nutrient, for example? We all know with breast cancer that there's an estrogen connection, right? We've, we've, we've known that for years. We know that if, if a woman has, is, is taking hormone replacement therapy, that influences their risk. We know that if they um, have been on birth control pills for a long time, that influences their risk. We know that they, if they start having their period at a young age or put off having their first child, that influences their risk, all because of the estrogen hormone. We also know that there are toxins in the environment that can act as estro uh, endocrine disruptors, right? They can influence the estrogen receptor. So, so that's an important thing to understand because there's, that's something we can do. We can do something about that as, you know, as much as we can, right? So we know that there are these endocrine disruptors. Those are substances that can mimic or influence the estrogen receptor in your body. So those are things like xenoestrogens. Really, it was back in I think it was 1991 or was early on at Tufts when they were doing research in breast cancer. And then they realized that the test tube was influencing their result. And that's when they started to think, okay, what's in this test tube? And that's when people started to realize, okay, BPA, that plastic that was in this test tube, was influencing the results they were getting in the lab. And so why you want to pay attention to some plastics in the environment. Right? That's why everybody's like, okay, we want to be BPA-free, because that can influence the estrogen receptor in your body. There's other plastics that we pay attention to, uh, 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 phthalates, there's parabens in your lotion and cosmetics. So you, we want to really think about all these things in the environment because they can influence whether, whether or not cancer cells can grow. Pesticides. Pesticides also can be uh, endocrine disruptors. So pesticides like the, the herbicides or pesticides that are on your lawn or in your food can also have an influence. And another reason why we want to be, we want to avoid the, you know, the, uh, the sign on the bottom there. We always, I always joke with my husband who's here today um, about, you know, our, our lawn is definitely a pesticide-free lawn, you know. Not all our neighbors are excited about it, but it's really healthier for all of us, right? It's really the right choice. Okay, oh, there it is. 
we should have that sign. <laughs> so what are some things you can do? You know, choosing organic as much as possible. We know that it's, it's, it's sometimes difficult to always choose organic. You may be eating out, but as much as possible, that's, this is one of the reasons why you want to do that, because it can, there, there are substances in these pesticides and herbicides that can influence the estrogen receptor. Um, using glass whenever possible, so you avoid a lot of that plastic, right? Like a glass water bottle, um, if you're filtering water, putting it into glass containers. If you're storing food, keep it in, t in glass containers as opposed to Tupperware. Avoiding as much plastic as you can. You don't want to heat in your plastic containers for your food because that plastic can get into your food. You know, get a reusable water bottle that's, that's, that's plastic free, you know, stainless steel or glass. And avoiding pesticides and herbicides on your lawn. We should really shift our thought process about, okay, what is, what's a healthy lawn, okay? Environmental Working Group, this is a great website. Has anybody been there before? Has anybody used that website? Really lots of good information, yeah. Really good information in terms of, of skincare products that you can use that are, that are healthier for you and your family. So in addition to all those things we were just talking about, you know, the sources of estrogen in your body, you know, your body fat actually influences your estrogen level in your body. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about that. We know that as our percentage of body fat increases, so does our estrogen level, and that then influences our risk of disease. So here's a, here's a, um, here's a cell. I know there's a pointer on here. Yeah, it's a great pointer. Okay, so here's a fat cell in your body. Okay, and you've got this, this substance, this enzyme in it called aromatase. And a lot of you have heard of that word aromatase, right? Because there's aromatase inhibitors that are many times used once you've had breast cancer for treatment. So what they do is they block this enzyme from, from producing estrogen. So there's in your cells, there's this enzyme um, aromatase. And what happens is there's other hormones floating around in your body. DHEA, testosterone, and what can happen in your fat cells is that that can get converted into estrogen with that enzyme aromatase. So what we know is when we have more fat cells, right, when we have more percentage of body fat, what happens? Right, and so that's why, that's why there's that connection with our percentage of body fat and our risk of, of breast cancer, but this is true for men as well. There's a lot of men in this room, so I'm going to make a point of this, because as our percentage of body fat goes up for men, their testosterone gets converted into estrogen, and that's one of the reasons there's a connection between percentage of body fat and prostate cancer, for example. So, so this, is, this is not just, just happening in women's body fat. And so I always focus with people on, let's work to lower percentage of body fat. So often we're, we're focused on, okay, what are the pounds, say, on the scale, right? What are our pounds? on the scale, but that's not really where we want to focus. We want to focus on our percentage of body fat. And so that's, that's where you, you really want to think about, okay, what can I do to, to change some of my body weight into lean muscle mass? And so what can we do? Work out, exercise, absolutely. This is one of the biggest reasons why exercise is so good for us, because it increases, well, it releases stress hormones, and, um, and, but it, but it, but it causes us to have higher levels of lean muscle mass. And that and is so health, healthy for so many reasons, but in this reason, because it's decreasing that conversion into more estrogen in our body. We also know that our body fat is really pro-inflammatory. So we always think, oh, our body fat's just sitting there. What happens, can I just do liposuction and get rid of it? What do you think happens if you do liposuction? Does it work? Temporarily. You know what it happens when you do liposuction? It, it will lower your percentage of, of body fat, but it doesn't, lower, um, it doesn't lower inflammation because it's not getting to the body fat that's deep in the body, around your organs, deep in the belly. So, so it's really not that helpful at lowering inflammation. They've done that study, okay? So, 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 uh, so we know that our body fat produces these, these markers, which you don't need to know their names, but that increases inflammation in the body. 
But we do know there's a lot, you know, this is this study just showing how as our, um, uh, that, that cancer is a consequence of obesity. As our uh, percentage of body fat goes up, so does all of these inflammatory markers in our body, these cytokines, and that then increases risk of, of cancer and multiple different types of cancer. But there's a lot that we can do. There's a lot we can do. So we remember I was talking about that enzyme aromatase, and many people may be on an aromatase inhibitor, but you can also help your body with, with lowering aromatase by lowering percentage of body fat. You also can lower aromatase by doing other things that decrease inflammation in your body. And that's why people talk about turmeric, for example. Turmeric is a nice anti-inflammatory herb, which I have right here, right, that lowers inflammation in your body. Um, we know fiber, for example, can, the more fiber in your diet, that can be very helpful as well. And flax seeds have a substance in them, a phytonutrient, we'll talk more about that, but that also has a good influence. We can also take, we can also help our body get rid of the estrogen that's floating around. Right? We can help with re improving the metabolism in our body, the me metabolism of that estrogen, and help our body get rid of it. And that's why we've heard so much about these cruciferous vegetables. Oops, pressing the wrong thing. Here we go. The cruciferous vegetables. Cruciferous vegetables are, what, what are some cruciferous vegetables? Broccoli, cauliflower. Spinach is okay, yep. Kale is even higher. Um, Cabbage is a cruciferous, Brussels sprouts. These vegetables have substances in them, DIM, indole 3 carbonyl, uh, sulforaphane, all those things that, that you may have heard their names. What they do is they help the body detoxify. So detoxify estrogen, other things too, but definitely estrogen and help with that metabolism and, and getting rid of that. So that's why you really wanna focus on those cruciferous vegetables and try to get them into your diet on a daily basis if possible. If you have a hard time digesting them, cook them. It's okay. You'll still get, you'll still get some of that stuff there. Um, other things that you hear about that people talk about that are so healthy for us, omega-3 fats, right, in our fish oil and our fatty fish and our ground flaxseed, that also helps with that metabolism and detoxification process. Really, it works, though. Like, sometimes people say, well, you know, what, what, is it going to help at this point? Is it going to make a difference at this point? But it does. They've done many studies looking at that if women, if they, survivors get on a good exercise program, lower percentage of body fat, that they have better survival. So it's, it's you know, sometimes it feels like, oh, at this point, what do I do? But, but it can make a big difference for people. So why are we worried about that body fat? Why can't we just do liposuction and suck out the, the fat? Why is it that the fat that's deep within the belly, around the organs, such a concern? Well, it's because of this process of insulin resistance. And we know that women who have higher levels of insulin have a higher rate of breast cancer. But we do know that insulin resistance is related to many different cancers out there. Lung cancer, prostate cancer, colon cancer. Insulin resistance is related to all of them. And I'm gonna tell you what insulin is, so don't worry, because you'll be like, what is she talking about insulin? Um, I'll tell you what I mean by insulin resistance, but, but understand that this body fat, the, the belly fat, the deep, the, the fat that we gain around our belly, increases our insulin levels, increases our risk of insulin resistance, and increases our risk of cancer. We know that when we have higher levels of insulin floating around, we have increased risk of the spread of cancer, and we have increased risk of reoccurrence and decreased survival, to the point where many oncologists are using medications that lower insulin level to, um, to improve treatment. So there are some oncologists using medications like metformin. Those are insulin sensitizing medications that help with improving outcome. But we don't, you know, we, we can do a lot of this just with lifestyle changes too, and I'm gonna explain that. Okay, so what do I mean by insulin? Because we know, as I said, insulin resistance is a problem. We don't wanna have insulin resistance. If we have more belly fat, we have more insulin resistance. But what do I mean by insulin resistance? So let's say here is, here's a, um, here's a typical, here's your typical blood sugar, right along here on the bottom, that green line. Okay, you wake up, your blood sugar is around 80, about, everybody's a little different. But you, that's where your, your fasting blood sugar is. And then you eat a meal. 
So your blood sugar goes up after you eat a meal. So what does the body have to do? It produces a hormone called insulin. Insulin is made in the pancreas, and it takes that food that you just ate, and it gets the food into the cells. So it's not floating around in the bloodstream. So insulin is the hormone that, that takes your food and gets it into your cells. And that's happening all the time, all day long. It's a, it's a phenomenal process, and that's normal. So what happens if we have a big meal? Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving's coming up, right? Thanksgiving's coming up, so you have a big meal, right? What happens to your blood sugar? Right? It go, it, you, you know, you, you have a big meal, so your blood sugar starts to go up. What does the body have to do? Make more insulin to handle all that food. Absolutely. So that, that's happening many times. What happens if you have a meal like, um, oh, I used to call this, this, in college we used to always go out, we'd have, I'd get a, I would get a pancake headache because I would have like pancakes with syrup and orange juice and then like get a headache afterwards. I did that all the time, right? So, so that kind of a meal, that's a very highly processed and easy to absorb food, orange juice is easy to absorb, the pancakes are really refined and processed, you might have some syrup on it. It all gets absorbed really quickly into the body. As a result, what does the body have to do? It produces more insulin, and it does that to keep the blood sugar in the normal range. Okay, but it's at that, that high level of insulin that we're concerned about because we know that high level of insulin can cause cancer to grow. So we wanna do whatever we can to keep that insulin from going so high. So we want to be avoiding those meals, like the pancake breakfast meal I just described, for example. If this was to go on for years and years and years, some people years and years, some people depending on their genetics, maybe just a few years. Some people if they you know, may never develop diabetes. But if this was to go on for a long time, that, you know, oops, back. Um, what would happen is the blood sugar, your insulin wouldn't be able to work well enough and your blood sugar would continue to go up and you'd get the diagnosis of diabetes. But what we're recognizing, and we do know that diabetes increases our cancer risk, but what we're recognizing is that this in-between time in here, even when you don't have the diagnosis of diabetes and your blood sugar might be completely normal on fasting blood work, if your body's making a lot of insulin to keep it normal, then that's a concern in terms of disease risk. It's a concern from a heart disease standpoint, it's concerned for risk of stroke, it's concerned of risk of cancer. Okay, so that it, when we say insulin resistance, what we mean is the body isn't responding to his insulin as well, it's making more insulin to keep the blood sugar normal, and it's that high level of insulin that increases risk of different diseases. So how do you know? So you go, how do you know if you have insulin resistance? So this, these are some things that you can say, okay, maybe this is an issue for me. First of all, it's really common. At least half of us in this country over the age of 50 have insulin resistance, so it's really a common thing. Um, but, but, but here's some clues. Maybe you've been gaining weight around the belly. Maybe you feel tired after you eat. Maybe it's, you're having a harder time losing weight. You crave sugary foods, um, hot flashes. That's true for men and women. Uh, as, and, and it's a little hard to tell if, there's, if it's chemotherapy related but, or menopause related, but more hot flashes, low blood sugar, changes in memory. Those are some signs. And here are some of the official ways that we can diagnose it. So, um, you know, you can check your waist to hip ratio. This is a great, great tool to have because as I said, remember, we're always so focused on the pounds of the scale and that can be exhausting. But focusing on your waist to hip ratio is a great way to really track yourself and say, how am I doing? Okay? So first you get your waist circumference. And what you want to do is you want to find your, sorry, <laughs> you told me not to do that. Um, find the top of your hip bone here, right? And the bottom of your ribs, like the last rib, and then go right in between. That's where you measure your waist circumference. So you got your hip bone, the bottom of your, your lowest rib, and in between, that's your waist. It's not just where your belly button is. So, and then your hip circumference, we say that over the greater trochanter, right about here, but just find the, you know, you, you want it to look better. You want your results to look better. So in this, in this situation, you find the biggest hip circumference possible because that will make your waist to hip ratio look better, right? You want your hips to be bigger than your waist 
in terms of risk for disease. So you find just your biggest waist circumference. So get your hip circumference, I'm sorry, your waist circumference, your hip circumference, and you divide the waist by the hip circumference. And greater than 0.8 is a concern for women. Um, it's more like 0.9 for men. Um, but this is a great thing you can monitor. You say, okay, I'm gonna make some changes in my lifestyle. I'm gonna stop getting the frappuccinos. I'm gonna cut some sugar out of my diet. I'm gonna start an exercise program. One of the things you can do is, is monitor your waist to hip ratio and say, okay, how am I doing here? Because that's really the weight you want to lose. That's the body fat you want to lose. Um, other signs that you may have insulin resistance is if you check your blood sugar and it's high, if, if you can have your physician check your fasting insulin and it's elevated, um, if your blood pressure has started to go up, that can be a sign. Uh, if, you're good, if you have your cholesterol checked and your good cholesterol, the HDL, is too low, or if the triglycerides are too high, those are all signs as well as is C-reactive protein. It's a blood test that can be done that it, it measures inflammation in your body. And you can ask your physician to do that as well. So why, why are we gaining weight around our belly? There's lots of reasons. There's lots of reasons and we're more, learning more and more. So we know that um, um, you know, just gaining weight in general for some people, depending on their genetics, will cause weight gain around the belly. But also, if we're making the wrong food choices. So when we're choosing foods that's really like that pancake breakfast, refined and processed foods, um, lots of refined and processed breads, crackers, cookies, uh, juices, sodas, sugar, sugar. That will cause us to gain more weight around the belly area. Uh, not getting enough exercise, get, not having good restful sleep, uh, increases our risk of insulin resistance. But there is also toxins in the environment. Um, we do know that BPA, remember we are talking about that plastic earlier, we know it's been connected with insulin resistance. And we also know that, uh, that, that the, our microbiome, our, our, the bacteria in our digestive system, if you've kind of seen a lot of this new research about our bugs in our gut, can influence lots of things in terms of our, our, our health. They can influence our immune system and all sorts of things, but they can influence our risk for getting insulin resistance too. So what can you do about it? Can you improve it? Can you, get insul can you improve your insulin sensitivity? Yeah, you can, right? You really can. So fiber, fiber is our friend. So what, what foods are high in fiber? Vegetables, awesome. Great source of fiber, all your vegetables. What else? Fruit, good source of fiber. Beans and legumes, did I hear beans? Beans and legumes, yep, beans and legumes. Nuts and seeds, great source of fiber. Ground flax seed, good source of fiber. All of these fibers are really good because what they do is they slow the digestion of your food. So instead of having your pancake breakfast, right, if you do something like, um, you know, an omelet with some vegetables in it and berries on the side, you know, that food is slower to digest and absorb. So your blood sugar is not going to go up as quick after you eat it. So your body doesn't have to produce as much insulin. You don't get that rise in insulin. And so your blood sugar stays more stable. Your insulin stays more stable. So fiber, fiber, fiber as your friend, or another good example for breakfast, right? Maybe steel cut oats with some nuts in it and flaxseed and berries. Also, much higher, much higher source of fiber. You know, having oranges as opposed to drinking the orange juice, much higher source of fiber that's gonna help with keeping your blood sugar more stable and it's gonna help prevent the, um, the, the, the jump in, sh in sugar that happens after a meal and the jump in insulin, which we know is so concerning. So fiber, 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 fiber. Having some protein at every meal. Does everybody have an idea of what what's food, foods are high in protein? What are some food? Meat, Meat eggs, cheese salmon. cheese, salmon, fish, beans and legumes. Spinach doesn't have a ton of protein. It has a little, but not a ton. More like your aunt, you know, the the, be the beef, chicken, fish, uh, eggs, nuts, nuts and seeds, beans and legumes most biggest sources of, of protein. Having some protein at every meal helps keep your blood sugar more stable. One of the other reasons that I would get a pancake headache, right, is because I didn't have any protein at that meal. It was really refined and processed food and there was no protein there. So, it, it, so, so that the protein helps also stabilize blood sugar and prevent spikes in insulin. 
Um, Omega-3 fats, that's your, that's your fish oil, ground flaxseed. Those fats are really um, help with lowering insulin, help with lowering inflammation in the body. We've known, we've heard a lot about the trans fats, right? The partially hydrogenated fats in, um, they, they've been removed a lot from our dot, from our, our food supply, which is great. They're still in our food supply a little bit. Some peanut butters will still use it. So look on the label. If you see partially hydrogenated fat, it says partially hydrogenated fat, you want to av avoid it. It's not good in terms of insulin levels. Exercise, right? My mother always wants me to say movement. She's like, don't say exercise, say movement. Yes, 40 minutes of movement a day is what's recommended. It doesn't matter if it's dancing, it doesn't matter if it's strength training, if it doesn't matter if it's walking or running. Really, whatever you're, wherever you are, embrace that. But just get moving 40 minutes a day. Say, okay, this is part of my daily routine. Uh, it really helps improve your, your insulin levels. It makes a big difference. They find that when people exercise, their insulin sensitivity improves, but it improves for about 24 hours after they do exercise. So that's where, we're, where the recommendation and all the research has really shown that the daily movement is where, where you get the best benefit. Getting good sleep, seven to nine hours. Um, stress management, doing things, we'll talk more about that and eliminating sources of um, inflammation in your body. We talked about avoiding BPA and other toxins. So fiber, fiber, fiber. Fiber's your friends for so many reasons. It helps with that whole detoxification process because it will bind to toxins and help them get eliminated from your body. Right, so you wanna say, okay, how can I get more fiber into my day? How can I include more vegetables into my day? Um, you know, maybe I can throw them into my omelet in the morning and have extra different vegetables on my salad at lunch and have a couple extra sides of vegetables at dinner. <laughs> you know, getting more vegetables in your day is gonna help with really increasing your fiber intake. And also it'll increase those phytonutrients, and we'll talk about those in a second. So, you know, it was interesting and they've done a lot of research in, um, in Europe. When, when women die of any reason, they, um, they do autopsies. And so what they find on a lot of women is that they have uh, precancer cells on, on autopsy. In fact, they say almost 50, 30 to 50 percent of women um, in, the, in their 40 to 50 age range have some of the DCIS, what we call DCIS or LCIS found um, when they do autopsies, which is kind of a huge percentage, right? I mean, a, a lot of women do go on and get breast cancer, you know, one in eight, but not this, it's not 30 to 50 percent, right? That's a much, much, much higher uh, percentage. So what do we know about that? That many precancer cells regress or they never turn into invasive cancer. And that's, I think, important for us to all realize that, that again, that terrain in our body influences whether these precancer cells become cancerous. And there are a lot of things we can do to help that terrain, and we'll talk about, but, but um, uh, mushrooms also have a huge impact on our immune system. So um, uh, reishi mushrooms, shiitake mushrooms, really have a lot of good impact on the strength of our immune system. And you can th you know, cook with them, eat them. Um, there, you'll see other uh, mushroom powders or different things that some people are using for that reason because it helps improve immune system function. Okay, so how can we build this healthy terrain? Because we want to create, right, that terrain in our body that's going to help our immune system work well, help prevent cancer formation or invasive cancer formation, right? So this, we talked about the movement, having a lot of fiber in your diet, uh, group support. Events like this are phenomenal, right? Because they give us a time to get together, meet other people, or going out with friends and family, going for walks with friends, Different types of group support really a bit is, is phenomenal. Getting enough sleep and rest, um, getting a lot of phytonutrients. Well, I'll talk about that in a second. Um, think people talk about green tea also can have a lot. It has this, um, it has a component in it that can help, that can, it's ECGC, that can help prevent the, uh, the spread of cancer. These are things we want to avoid because these create an unhealthy terrain in our body, which can help encourage cancer to grow, right? So, so uh, toxin exposure, stress, you know, lots of stress can have an impact, as we all know. 
because it can lower natural killer cell activity and the functioning of our immune system. Um, alcohol, we'll talk about that in a second. Um, in high levels of insulin, all these things create an unhealthy terrain in your body and can encourage the growth of cancer. Many studies to show this, this is just one showing that, that when there's more inflammation in your body, it, it creates a, a, a soil that can allow or encourage cancer to grow. So how do you know if you have inflammation? Everybody's talking about inflammation, right? People, pa patients come to me every day and say, well, I've heard I ha about inflammation. Do I have inflammation? How do I know? Okay, so here are some signs. Okay, okay, maybe I have to work on lowering inflammation in the body. You can ask to get blood work done. So your physician can check a C-reactive protein or a SED rate, that's the ESR. If those are high, that, those are signs of inflammation. Some people have normal levels of these markers but still have some inflammation. So it's not a perfect test, but it is a, it is a test that you can do. If you feel like you're holding onto a lot of water, you get bloated, uh, you feel bloated after you eat, you joint pain, asthma, there's uh, eczema, digestive issues. These are always all some signs that there may be increased inflammation in your body. And here's just some ways that you can, okay, how do I help change things so I can lower inflammation in my body, okay? And we've talked a lot, or a lot of people talk about the um, omega-6 and omega-3 ratio of, what the, of your foods, okay? So we know that when we're eating too many foods that have unhealthy fats in them, that that increases inflammation. So if we switch and get more of these healthy fats in our diet, the fish oil, the ground flaxseed, um, salmon, sardines, good healthy fishes, that, that that can help with lowering inflammation. Lots of foods out there, turmeric, resveratrol, ginger, green tea, they have anti-inflammatory benefits. And some people will even say, well, you know what, I think I'm, I'm having a lot of inflammation and I wonder maybe if my diet is contributing to the inflammation in their body. And so with some people, they'll, they'll, they'll do a trial of an elimination diet to say, you know, could my food, my, the, what I'm eating, be causing more inflammation for me? And so, so there's lots of different types of elimination diets out there in book form. Um, I work with Mark Hyman, so that's why I've got his book up here, but it's also a really good one. But the 10-day um, detox diet, this is a type of a diet which is an elimination diet. What it's doing is it's pulling away foods that are caused it, that, that are very commonly causing inflammation for some people. So it removes a lot of foods that may be pro-inflammatory for that person, and maybe something to try if you're wondering if food is impacting the inflammation in your body or some of your symptoms or how you feel. So detoxification, people talk about detoxification all the time, don't they? So does anybody have any idea when people say detoxification, what does that mean? They're like, oh, detoxification. Do I need to take this shake? Do I need to take these powders? What, what does it mean when we say detoxification? Well, recognize the fact that the body has a tremendous ability to detoxify. It is set up to detoxify. It, you know, you, when you sweat, you're detoxifying. When you're urinating, you're detoxifying. Your bowel movement, you're detoxifying. You know, when you're stimulating lymph flow with massage or lymphatic circulation, you're, you're improving detoxification. So there's, the body is really set up. The liver is working to detoxify. What we want to do is support our natural detoxification ability. So that's what really we're here for, is we want to think, okay, how can I support my body's natural detox system? Because, you know, I am going to be exposed to some toxins because, unfortunately, there's way too many of them in our environment. So I'm going to be exposed to some of them. How can I help my body detoxify? So here's just a, a, a list of all these potential carcinogens and toxins. But there's also toxins that are produced within our body all the time. That's when I was talking about, you know, your body makes hormones and then it has to get, get rid of them. Alcohol is a, is a toxin that's been well, it can act as a toxin in the body if it's in excess, and it has been associated with an increased risk of breast cancer, so we kind of have to talk about that a little bit. You know, unfortunately, we know that as a woman's alcohol intake goes up, so does her risk of breast cancer. It's even a linear relationship, so every one extra drink a day that a woman has, her risk of breast cancer goes up. And this is just to remind us what is considered a drink. Um, you know, uh, 12 ounces of beer is one drink, five ounces of wine, or an ounce, of ounce and a half of 
hard alcohol is considered a drink. What is considered moderation for women? What's okay for women with alcohol? Yeah, one glass of wine. Anybody else have any ideas what's considered moderation? So it's considered one or less a day or five or less a week. That's considered moderation for women, just so, just so we get an idea of what's, what's, what's moderation. And after that, there has been this unfortunate linear relationship in terms of risk of breast cancer. And they've shown that even with, with women getting more than two drinks a day, they have like a three-time increased risk. So why? There's all sorts of ideas as to why that may be. It may be impacting our liver and that natural detoxification system that we've got. It may be impacting our estrogen levels through this whole process that increases level of estrogen in our body. It may be associated with other unhealthy lifestyles. Maybe if we drink more, we're, we're um, exercising lesser, or um, we're, we're drinking and having a hamburger and fries with it or something. I'm just making that up. But it may be associated with other unhealthy lifestyle choices. Um, but there's also this theory, and, that, and, and many nutritionists are really looking at this, that there's a connection between, between the B vitamins, that alcohol uses up your B vitamins and, um, and it does. Alcohol, you need, it uses B vitamins to get processed. So is, is the association because you're depleting your B vitamin stores in your body and then that's influencing risk of disease? So, so that's also an important thing to pay attention to. In fact, Walter Willett, who's a big nutritionist at Harvard, he's been doing research for years and years and years, and he feels like we just need to give women a, a good B complex with their alcohol, you know? Maybe that's, maybe that's true. Um, <laughs> when you get a good B-complex, if that's what you're choosing to do, get one that doesn't have folic acid. Get it with folate, the methylfolate, because folic acid, there's some concerns about that. But as a, you can always come up and ask me about it if you want more questions, too. So what can you do to help your body's natural detoxification system, right? We talked about fiber, 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 lots of fluids, drinking a lot of water. Um, uh, choosing organic whenever possible. We talked about those cruciferous vegetables and just some of the benefit of things like garlic and cilantro and dandelion greens. You know, really, foods for detoxification, lots and lots and lots of foods help support your detoxification system. What you'll notice on here is that it's really like a whole foods diet. When you're choosing food that's really real and whole, that's going to support your natural detoxification system. When you're, we want to avoid the junk foods. We call them junk foods because they're, they are really low in nutrient value. Um, they're high in calories, but they don't have a lot of vitamins or minerals or phytonutrients in them, so they're, they're they're not going to really support your body's natural ability to detoxify. And look at this woman sweating. You know, other, other ways, you know, sweating through mo good movement and exercise. Um, some people will do things like saunas or get lymphatic massage uh, that also helps with detoxification and lots of exercise. Well, how am I doing on time? What's the time? Four minutes? Oh, boy. Okay, the gut microbiota influences our risk of, of breast cancer. That's about all I'm going to say right now <laughs> because I got four minutes, um, but that's okay. Because I really, you know, I'm going to do a book a DVD signing afterwards, and I've got my DVDs downstairs, and um, there's lots of information in there. Like I said, can't get to it all today, so feel free to pick one of those up. Um, I also have a, um, on my website, um, if you go to my website, I'll tell you about it in a second, but you can sign up for a free ebook. It kind of summarizes a lot of this information as well, so you can, you can do that, and I'll give you all those resources in a second. Because phytonutrients, phytonutrients are the, you know, in plant foods, in any food, we've got our vitamins and minerals, but in plant foods, we also have these substances called phytonutrients, which we realize are so good for our health. So phytonutrients are really these important components uh, that, that we're learning about. ECGC is a phytonutrient. Um, um, uh, lutein is a phytonutrient. They have important health benefits that they're not vitamins, they're not minerals, but they can lower uh, the um, oncogenic potential of a carcinogen. So if, a, if something that was going to cause cancer gets into your body, the more phytonutrients that you have, the less likely that is to occur. 
So you want to think color. I, I love color. You want to eat from the rainbow every day, right? And, and so you want to have some foods from every color of the rainbow every day. You want to have a red food every day. You want to have an orange food, a yellow food, a green food, a blue purple food, a, a white tan food, and that's like garlic, um, mushrooms. You can't, you can't use Skittles, that doesn't count. <laughs> You gotta get it from your plant foods. But think about oh, your teas and coffees count too, um, and your uh, uh, um, spices are really high in phytonutrients, and um, all your vegetables are really high in phytonutrients. So, so, and I use this with kids a lot too, is did you eat from the rainbow today? Did you eat from every color of the rainbow? And it's a great way to sit back and say, how did I do? Did I get in a lot of phytonutrients? Um, eight to 10, that's really the gu gu guideline of, okay, I wanna get eight to 10 half cup servings. So that would be like four to five cups of vegetables a day. Glucosinolates, isoflavones, you know, this is just talking about healthy sources of soy being okay for a lot of women in terms of breast cancer. But, but we're really talking about healthy sources, tofu, edamame, not processed soy. I'm really concerned about soy that's in our, um, our, our, our bars and our shakes. Um, a texturized soy protein and cereals that they use to increase protein content. We don't know enough about them. Other good phytonutrients. This is like my top 10 foods for breast wellness. Um, broccoli, mushrooms, fatty fish, ground flaxseed. My top 10. Berries, seaweed. Oh, we talked about exercise and how good it was for us, the importance of sleep. How many of us are doing this? Look at the husband over there sleeping. <laughs> but what is she doing working? In bed, with her computer, not good. That light's not good for us. You know, we know that, um, we know that, that, that sleep deprivation increases cortisol and insulin levels, and it increases risk of lots of diseases, cancer just being one of them. Um, great, you know, there's lots of good resources out there. Here's just one in terms of what we can do in terms of improving our sleep routine. So we're giving ourselves time to get in those seven to nine hours of sleep we need a night. And you know what I always tell people is don't, don't, don't stress out if you're not able to sleep throughout the night. You know, this, if you wake up in the middle of the night, it's a great time to add in some relaxation exercises, your breath work. You know, don't sit there and go, oh my goodness, I can't believe I'm not sleeping, I'm gonna get cancer, or I have, you know. <laughs> that's not what we wanna really have happen. We really wanna say, okay, this is a time where I can do my breath work to calm down my body. Um, on my DVD, I have um, lots of great, uh, Heidi Spear, I did my DVD with Heidi Spear. She did um, um, three different yogas, three different yoga routines. One of them's great for nighttime. It's very, it's like a yoga nidra, a very calming routine to help with getting to sleep. And she also has a, D, uh, a CD universe, which I love, which has a lot of things that you can listen to and can help with getting back to sleep or calming down your body or helping to relieve stress. Because we know that stress, <laughs> we know that stress impacts things. Um, it increases cortisol in our body. It lowers natural killer cell activity. Not good for us. But this is what I always want to show, this study, because I think this is really important to recognize, is they took, three, they, they took a bunch of, of, uh, of rats, and they divided them in, into three groups. And they gave them enough cancer cells so that half of them uh, would develop cancer and die. So that was this study they did. Okay, they said, I'm gonna give these rats cancer cells so enough of them, so typically half of them would die of cancer. But then they gave them stress. So they gave uh, uh, two groups, uh, one group they didn't do anything to, they just let them be. The other two groups, they stressed them out, they shocked them, which was really stressful for them. The one group, they just shocked them. And then the other group, they gave them a lever so that if they figured it out and they pressed the lever, the shock would stop. And so what's really interesting is when they looked at the rats, they go, okay, the group that, um, the group that was shocked, um, only 27% rejected the tumor. So that is, trying to do math right now, 73% instead of 50% got cancer and died. 
If they didn't give them shock, 54%, more than that 50%, but only 54% rejected the tumor. But the rats that had the lever, 63% rejected the tumor, more so than the rats that didn't have the shock. The important thing to take away here is it's not necessarily the stress, but it's how we, what tools we have to respond to that stress that's really important. And so I know there's been a lot of great events here today to help with that. You know, the self-massage and exercise and relaxation exercises, really important to give yourself tools to help you manage the stress in your daily life. A gratitude journal is a great tool for that that saved my life. Um, so here's just like my top 10 things to do for overall wellness. And um, as I said, it's all summarized in that um, the uh, ebook or my DVD, whatever you'd like to, to get. And as, as I said, my ebook, you can just go to my website, which is right here, Dr. Boham. You can sign drboham.com. You can sign up for it. And you can download the free ebook. Um, I'm going to be doing a DVD signing after this today downstairs on the first floor. If you'd like to get a DVD, but if you choose to get it later, you can use some of these discount codes as well um, uh, to to do that. Okay. So it was a pleasure being with you all today. Thank you so much for having me. I need to draw this, and I love Kripalu. I was just at Kripalu last weekend. It's like my favorite place. And tell us, you get to do yoga there, and yep, other. It's it's a it's a phenomenal place. It's a yoga it's a yoga center, but um, you don't have to do lots of yoga if you don't like yoga. You can just go for beautiful walks. It's right in the Berkshires. Um, uh, it's they've got phenomenal food and mm -hmm. lots of programs that you can go to as well. It's, and this it's is really for, fun. I think a two night stay. Ooh. Right? I believe that's what I read in here. Yeah? Right. Let me get it out. I don't want to mislead anybody. But yeah, who doesn't love yoga? Has anyone tried it and not liked it? Yeah, so relaxing. I like it. I mean, some, yeah, it's so relaxing. That and, eye right there. Yeah, right? Yeah. And you know what? If there is a kind you don't like, there's lots of different ones to try. You know, so there's like sometimes some people like the more intense yoga, but mm -hmm. other people like the uh, of a, a restorative yoga. So there's lots of different ones to try if you haven't found if you haven't found one you like yet. I like the one where I go to a different place and it's euphoric. Mm -hmm. I'm on a cloud. Yeah, Anywho. they take you. Yeah, like yeah. Yoga so this is for uh, that. Believe uh, that says two nights. It does say it does. It's two nights. R and R. Oh, that's Who wants lovely. this? Me. Okay. okay. Then I, I guess we should draw for. This. I can't draw myself, huh? Okay. No. Yeah, I know. We should get a ticket in there. Okay, let's see who the winner is. Okay. Da, this is really fun. I'm so excited to get to see. Okay, here I go. 822925. Oh! <laughs> and just so you know, it costs 525 to go for two nights, so that might even be worth it as well, right? Yeah. All worth it. It's Look all at worth you. it. Oh, have fun. Yes. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Yay. Congratulations. Wow, this is so exciting. So you're going to be downstairs. I'll be downstairs. Signing DVDs. And so answering you're... questions if anybody has any. Okay. And Just find me in, the, in there, right? Yes, find you <laughs> in there on floor one. Thank you all for coming today. Um, how, how many of are, you are coming tonight? So excited about tonight. Okay, well, thanks, everyone. You're all so beautiful, even the guys. <laughs> I like them, too. And we'll see a lot of you tonight. <laughs> That was awesome. Oh, thank you. Wow. Well, I'm the head reporter, so.